Hello and happy Friday, one and all. It is me, Alex Cox, back again for another Find My Past Fridays Live. It's very, very nice to be here with you all. I hope you're all doing well. Oh, I can see we've already got a good number of people watching. Brilliant. Well, there's no point in hanging about then. Um, yeah, don't be shy. Say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me know where the weather, what the weather's saying. It's very, very grey and miserable where I am in Twickenham now. What's happened to this summer? The one summer where we're all stuck domestically going on beach holidays in the UK. And if you're in the UK, that is. I know many people are watching in the United States. Howdy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and the weather's been terrible. It feels like summer's always over. Well, summer's, summer's almost over. But anyway, less of the negative, more of the positive. It's great to be here. Glad it's Friday. Friday means l more new records from us uh, and more family history fun. Um, I'm going to take a quick look at who um, everybody was saying hi in the comments in a second. But very quickly, what are we talking about today? Actually, I should do my, my, my normal little intro bit. If you're tuning in for the first time, I know most of you aren't. The gang, the gang are here. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. We do these every single Friday. I'm going to stop rocking on my chair. Uh, it's a nice opportunity for us to just basically share what we've been working on, what we've released, what's coming up, what we're excited about, what we're finding interesting at the moment, but more importantly, share tips, advice, um, not just from me, each other. Um, if you know, if, you, if you're if you're if you're a fledgling family historian uh, and you've got any questions, pop them in the comments. I will try my best to spot them and answer them live. But if I don't get to them, which I might not do because there's a lot of comments coming through already, uh, there are some incredibly knowledgeable people here who I'm sure if they can help, they certainly will. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the things I love about this. It's we all come together and share our insights, uh, tips, tricks, little nuggets of knowledge, all that jazz. Anyway, what are we talking about? Well, um, a few things today. So obviously today is Friday. We've we've published new records. So I wanted to take a look at those. We've got some new Paul Orr records for Ireland. Um, if you have Irish ancestors, give it. You know, some people say Irish family history is impossible. It's it's not. It, it's certainly a challenge. Who doesn't love a challenge? It's definitely not impossible. Uh, but one of the one of the tricks with the family Irish family history research, given that so much material isn't available online, well, there's a lot, but given so much was destroyed and hasn't survived, you just need to be clever with the resources you're using. And that's why things like Paul or records can become so invaluable. Uh, if your ancestor entered into a work, if your ancestor ever passed through a workhouse, many of us will have ancestors that, that at least did a spell in, in, in the workhouse at some point in their lives. Uh, most actual Irish workhouse registers haven't survived not online. So resources like Poor Law, uh, Union Guardian Minute Books and things like that can be absolutely invaluable. But anyway, we'll get to those in a second when we're looking at this week's new records. So we've got, yeah, new Irish Poor Law records, very useful if you have Irish ancestors and just generally interested, very fascinating if you've got a general interest in social history, as I'm sure we all do. Uh, loads of lovely new newspapers as well. So we'll take a little look at those. And uh, then also, I thought we'd do something, I'd do something a little bit different today. Um, obviously, you know, family history records are, are mainly used for family history. Uh, we know based on the popularity of of, of uh, quite a few of our house history blogs and some of the live streams we've done around house history that it's becoming increasingly popular to use the same records you'd use to trace the stories of your ancestors to trace the stories of properties whether it's a house you live in a house you're perhaps interested in buying somewhere you're visiting staying or maybe somewhere you grew up in um but what about items what about items can you use family history records to add history to an heirloom or an antique um Items carry their own history. Uh, I, I love old items. I love antiques. I love heirlooms. Holding things that you know were used and formed a, a, a key part of someone's life, maybe a hundred, even hundreds of years ago, can be some, something quite special. And that's, that's one of the um, emotional, powerful things about heirlooms. If you're holding something that you know your ancestor used frequently, it just makes that connection feel a little bit closer, a little bit more real, I think. So in the spirit of that, well, and the other reason I'm asking as well is, Actually, no, I'll say the question of the week first. In the spirit of that, this week's question of the week is, tell us about your own. Do you have any antiques or family heirlooms with a fascinating history? Maybe it's a story that's been passed down through the generations attached to this item. Maybe it's a result of some research you've done yourself. Tell us what the item is. Tell us its story. Tell us what it means to you. Um, but what I'd also love to hear because one of my uh, new lockdown hobbies is I'm getting alarmingly into auctions. Um, I've always loved antiques. My my wife 
my wife and my my wife and I have quite different tastes in home de- decor. If I could decorate the house the way I wanted to, it would look like it was haunted. If she could decorate it the way she wanted to, it would be very sparse, Nordic, Scandinavian looking. So I think I'm just going to have a room where I can put all my spooky old stuff. Uh, but yeah, I'm very keen to hear any tips any of you watching might have that I can use myself to start learning about more of the, the junk I'm picking up at auction. Uh, I also want to do a bit of show and tell because I did I got a purchase last week that I'm particularly pleased with. And I've done a little bit of my own research into it. And I've actually found a surprising amount about this item and the person who made it. So we will get to that shortly. And then depending on how we get on for time, we'll have a quick look at uh, holiday history. I know I've already done a live on history of holidays earlier in the summer, but our sister website, the British Newspaper Archive, which runs an absolutely fantastic blog, uh, they've been exploring all things holiday at the moment. And there's some very, very informative posts on there on all sorts, you know, tips on how to make them the best of your beat, make make the most of your beach trip, beach holiday, uh, the the amazing impact the rail, the, the expansion of the railway system had on British holiday making. There's loads there, but depending on how we, if, if we don't get to that, you can read it all in all its glory on the British Newspaper Archive blog. I'm sure Ellie, who is on the comments, will pop a link in for you to access it easily. Um, so yeah, that is the agenda for today, um, and I hope you enjoy it. So before we dive in and take a look at this week's new records, let's have a look what we are all saying. So, oh, loads of people. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Beth. Uh, in sunny Anglesey. Jealous. Love Anglesey. Hello, Jane. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Bev. Sorry if I'm racing through these, but there's quite a lot of them. Hello, Karen in lovely Harrogate, the spa town. Very nice place. Um, Sally Colgrove, blimey, I was rushing to get here. Afternoon from Grey Whitney near Oxford. Well, thank you for rushing. I hope it was worth the rush. Uh, Hello, Andrea in Stoke. Oh, hello, Lynn in Colorado. Um, Hello, Graham. Great to chat. Hello, um, Kathy. There's loads. Uh, Rosie, Jenny. I'm just going to say hello to everybody because if I just list through everybody, you'll probably get a little bit bored. Um, a few people say their Facebook's being a pain. Sorry to hear that. Marion also making me jealous. Glorious West of Ireland. Lots of sun emojis. Not like that where I am. Um, Great. Well, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, And just to remind you all, this week's question of the week, tell us about your antiques, your heirlooms, the items you've got in your house that you love and have an interesting history attached to them. Is it something you discovered yourself? Is it something you passed down? If you did discover it yourself, I'd be particularly interested to find out how you did it. I've got a few very, very, very basic tips for doing this, uh, which I'll share in a bit. My plan was actually to give uh, quite a comprehensive view of... um, of of discovering the history of items but it turns out um antique experts are experts for a reason because it takes years of training so uh i will only be scratching the surface but yeah i'm I'm looking forward to getting to that so we'll take a look at new records but remember if you're popping in an answer to question of the week just start it with q o t w there so i can easily spot it and read it read it out because we all love hearing about each other's discoveries stories and in this case treasured family heirlooms right so this week's new records what do we got well i've kind of given it away already it is a lot of very very interesting irish polo records we've got two big updates to um two collections our waterford polo union board of guardians minute books and similarly our claire polo union board of guardian minute books um as i've said already uh these are very very useful resources if your ancestors did pass through a workhouse because a lot of the workhouse registers um for ireland haven't actually survived um so yeah these, these are great and they, they they actually give quite a lot of information in some cases some individual cases are treated with incredible depth they go into a lot of detail and a uh, lovely thing about both of these collections this week is you're not just getting transcripts you're getting those all important original images uh which if you if you if you, if if an image is available, you'd be utterly daft not to look at it. That's where you'll find a lot of the richness, the additional clues, information you you won't find anywhere else to really complete the story. 
But if you're watching and you're scratching your head uh, and thinking, I mean, I know a lot of you are quite experienced genealogists, so you know what poor law unions were. Uh, but say if you're watching from North America, for example, and you might not be quite as au fait with, with the, the intricacies of Irish poor law history. Uh, I'll give a very, very, very brief overview, the best I can. Um, so poor law unions were set up in Ireland in 1839. Uh, this was under a government act, the Ireland Poor Law Act of 1838. Uh, and this act was actually a pretty unpopular and decisive one, De not decisive, divisive, that's the word I'm looking for, quite a divisive one. Um, actually, not a single Irish MP voted for it. Um, and those who were slightly more on the liberal end of the political spectrum were very concerned about the law as it stood. Because uh, basically, they argued this isn't going to provide aid for the most vulnerable poor who desperately need it. Whereas conservatives, on the other hand, were um, they, they they their opposition to it was that they didn't want to foot the bill. They they had a clear sense of um, the significant levels of poverty affecting Ireland at this time. You know, it's it's not that it's in the similar era to the Great Famine. You know, a lot of poverty in Ireland, a lot of suffering. Something needed to be done. And the Poor Law Act of 1838 was an attempt to, to do that. Um, so up until up until this act was passed, all relief for the poor had been provided on a charitable basis. So it, it relied on the goodwill of, of, of benefactors. And if there weren't enough benefactors with enough goodwill to go around, poor people were going to continue to suffer. Um, and England and Wales at that time already had existing poor laws to build on. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates when they started, but I think they go quite a bit further back. Um, so yeah, Ireland was starting from scratch. Um, and when, when we're talking about the government at this time, it, it's the Westminster government. Of course, Ireland was still firmly under British rule. Um, and Westminster had been looking at revamping poor law policies in England. And they thought at the time, they thought, well, this is a, why not use this as an opportunity to implement something proper and serious in Ireland. Um, sorry, I'm full of cold today. So if I found a, sound a bit snotty and gross, I do, do, do apologise. Um, so yeah, there'd been quite a bit of consternation in, in Westminster as well about how this problem of poverty in Ireland, which was a serious one, was to be dealt with because levels of poverty in Ireland at that time were far higher than those in England and Wales, which, which already had significant levels of their own to deal with. So um, in 1833, a few years before this Poor Law Act was put through, a chap called Archbishop R R Richard Watley, uh, he was he was uh, of the Dublin Church of he was in, based in the Dublin Church of Ireland, and he was put in charge of the Royal Commission on the Poorer Classes of Ireland. Uh, and what 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 did Watley do? Well, his first step was to ignore uh, the suggest all suggestions that he make sure his report tallied up with the plans that West that Westminster had in mind, um, and. He started his own basically comprehensive survey of the levels of poverty in Ireland by interviewing people from all over the country. So it's a good job he ignored that advice. He was quite forward thinking and, you know, obviously deeply religious man being an archbishop, cared, cared very greatly about the needs of his flock. Um, so, yeah, he went, he interviewed people all over the country of all social classes. And based on this research he conducted himself, he formed a pretty detailed picture of the cause of, of the kind of root causes behind this very endemic poverty. Um, he, there were a couple of reports published between 1835 and 1839, and he basically can his his main conclusion was that Irish poverty was caused by a lack of access to jobs. It doesn't sound like rocket science, does it, at the time? But you know, given the attitudes in Westminster. It, it's good that he, he actually had to spell it out so plainly for them. Sorry. So uh, he recommended then that rather than bring simply bringing in a copy of English poor law laws over to Ireland, what needed to be done was to, to start this really comprehensive drive to create employment, create jobs. That's how we'll lift people out of poverty, create jobs for the poor. <coughs> and what do you think uh, Westminster did? They completely ignored him. They ignored his advice entirely. Uh, the, instead, the English Poor Law Commissioner, a chap called Sir George Nichols, was brought in. They, they just didn't listen to him at all, cast his advice aside. They brought George Nichols in to work out how to fit England's existing laws into an Irish context, a very, very lazy slapdash approach, which I think it's fair to say didn't really work and led to further unnecessary suffering. 
Um, and Nichols did try to do his own research. He took six weeks traveling around Ireland before writing a report. And, subs- and after that, he basically draft, drafted this very, very contentious bill and oversaw the setting up of these poor law unions. Uh, there are 162 unions across Ireland. Um, these would eventually correspond with the various civil registration districts that were dotted around the country. Dublin was divided into two, north and south. Uh, each union was overseen by a board of guardians, and that's what these records pertain to. These are the, the notes and minutes kept at the meetings of these board of guardians. And the board of guardians' job was basically to set up workhouses, make sure they were... Pre- well maintained, stocked, keep a record of expenditure, who was coming in, who was going out, how they were operating, basically how everything was running. But that wasn't that was their main responsibility. Their other responsibility was to collect tax to pay for poor law relief itself. That, so as they were collecting tax, they were elected by those who paid their what was then called assess tax, which was similar to rates for property owners or leaseholders above a certain income threshold. Uh, and as you can imagine, these elections were pretty contentious. Um, they were to do with tax. What do you expect? Uh, one, Dublin meet, one Dublin meeting at, um, to allow the elect candidates actually famously el- descended into a very, very violent brawl over concerns about the orange influence that was presiding over the board. Um, and uh, according to reports you can find in the newspapers on this, the first Dublin, the first Dublin elections held in June 1839 were held with great vehemence and no little acrimony. Sorry, I didn't pronounce that very well. But as basically, as the 19th century progressed, the work of the board of the work of the board of guardians was far more tightly regulated. Things did improve. It wasn't always this. T- it wasn't pretty, but it, it did get slightly better. Um, and therefore later minute books. So when you're looking at this collection, that, well, that's with, with, with only collections that span quite a wide date range, um, th- things can get more standardized over time. A record from you know the late 1700s will look completely different maybe to a record taken in the late 1800s. We see that with parish records. Um, early parish records are almost impossible to read. Whereas parish records from the uh, you know, late 1800s and early 1900s are beautifully laid out with their nice grids, everything in its right place, very easy to identify. So that's just something to bear in mind. You know, they they the format varies by date and the later ones will follow this very strict format, which would ensure uh, suitable care was taken about the health provisions, for, particularly for deserted children. Um, so, yeah, that's what these records are. I think one of the things that's important to remember is I always like you know doing looking back at social history it's always nice to always a nice way always a nice way to help you count thank your lucky stars that we live in the time we live in i mean we read the news the world can seem like a very depressing place at times but it's definitely better than it ever has been (laughs) in many 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 ways um because back in the 18th 19th centuries this these poor law unions were the only safety net for destitute people and they weren't particularly kind places it was quite a harsh system there was no public health system uh, workhouse hospitals were the only often the only access that poor people would have to health care so yeah um so just to recap that was that was my kind of garbled history of irish poor law uh, unions but we just to remind you all we've got two new collections we have the um Board of Guardian Minute Books from Clare Unions and Board of Guardian Minute Books from the Waterford Unions. Um, And I've kind of already touched on it, but um, Minute Books are, um, yeah, essentially the notes that they took. Um, (coughs) They would record things like uh, the number of admissions coming in, number of people going out um sorry i'm very very sniffly you'll find details of staff you'll find details of expenditure Uh, i mean to give you an idea of what you'll find in these records both collections are relatively similar Uh, in the the transcripts you'll find pretty basic information you'll find the individual's name whether that is a inmate staff member supplier because even some of the suppliers people supplied clothing medicines foods to the workhouse their names appear in here nice or interesting bit of family history if, if it turns out your ancestor ran a business in ireland and they were one of the companies supplying the local workhouse 
but yeah, you'll find their name, you'll find their age, you'll find their birth year, you'll find their occupation, which is very interesting if they're an inmate, you can kind of get an idea of their social status and what they were doing before they fell on such hard times that necessitated them to take themselves into the workhouse, which nobody wanted to do. I think I've heard a quote before that the workhouse was one of the most feared institutions in Ireland. Um, they weren't nice places. Uh, you'll find the date of the entry uh, in the minute books, uh, and as well, you know, you'll find, as well as the other key information, so the place it was recorded at. Um, that could also be birthplaces, the location, the workhouse, the union itself. But of course, it's the images that are going to provide you with loads and loads more detail. Um, there, I think it's fair to, I've had a look at some of these, um, and particularly the later ones, they are excellently captured. They're very neat, the handwriting is very clear, which is always refreshing when you're looking at original images. Um, and if your ancestor was an inmate and they were, in, or actually if your ancestor was an inmate or staff member, if they were included in the minutes, the reason for them being included in the minutes will often be in there. And there's a load of different circumstances for why that might be. But the kind of things you'll see in there will, if you know, if they were a member of staff or a guardian themselves, uh, if they were receiving outdoor relief for work, such as breaking stones, if they if they paid or collected the poor rates we just mentioned, um, if they'd requested assistance with emigration, emigrate, emigration, this could be particularly useful for any of you over watching in North America who have Irish roots and are trying to trace the story back across the Atlantic and you want to find out what happened to your ancestors and what prompted them to leave and seek a new life in the new world. If you find, I mean, what better evidence could you find than that? You find them in the Workhouse Minute books and they've actually requested assistance to leave Ireland and start a new life. Uh, you'll find notes on whether they were an orphaned or deserted child. Um, and if they were inmates in the workhouse with special circumstances, that could be medical, uh, there might be other reasons. That'll all be very, very clearly noted down. So yeah, very, very detail rich records. And I do think you should be, if your ancestors are in there, you'll be able to find out quite a bit. Uh, one of the things I'd like to remind you, though, of course, is these aren't the only uh, workhouse poor law collections we have on Find My Pass for Ireland. Alongside these new additions from Clare and Waterford, you'll find collections from Dublin, Donegal, Galway, Sligo. Um, there's, 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 there's a good amount for you to for you to sink your teeth into. Um, and if any, actually anyone watching, bonus question of the week: If your ancestors entered into the workhouse uh, and you found them in workhouse records, tell us their story. Um, I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on the the, the noble and the great. The, the, the impressive deeds, the impressive feats of our ancestors, and sometimes neglect to really dive into the stories of those who are much less fortunate um, and explore their struggles. So yeah, if you guys have any workhouse ancestors and you've found anything interesting in the records, let us know in the comments. But of course, that is not all. Oh, I've got, I'm already, time is already ticking. I need to, I need to get a move on. Uh, and it's not all. Um, as we do every single week, we've added a whole host of new newspapers. Um, we, I think we've got eight new titles joining our ever-expanding ar archives. We've got the British Army Dispatch covering 1848 to 1856. Very interesting military title. If your ancestor was serving in the British Army in the 1840s, 1850s, exploring its contents could be a really great way of getting a good idea of what life was like for your enlisted man or... or um, or, or even a commissioned officer. You've got the City Chronicle covering 1840 to 1843 um, and the Commercial Chronicle, um, that both London titles. Um, Fleming's British Farmers Chronicle. Again, <coughs> if you're, that, 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 I, I, that's probably, a spe I think what I'd call a special interest title, but if your ancestors were farmers, it's a must read. It'll, it'll give you, it'll tell you what, what, what were the hot topics for Britain's farming community in the mid 1800s. What were they sitting around the dinner table complaining about? What were they looking to purchase? What were they selling? What were they? What were their hopes, dreams, fears? Find out with the uh, with Fleming's Britain's British Farmers Chronicle. We've got two more London titles: London Mercury, um, eighteen twenty-eight, and London Mercury, eighteen forty-seven. Uh, I believe these actually are two distinct titles, despite having the exact same name. They just had different lifespans. And la uh, not last but not least, uh, second to last but not least. Sainsbury's Weekly Register and Advertising Journal. I'm not quite sure whether this has any direct relation to the Sainsbury's family or 
Sainsbury's, which if you're watching in North America or overseas, is one of the biggest supermarket chains in the UK. Um, but what I can tell you is it's mainly adverts. Uh, so it's 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 pretty much an, an ad paper. Uh, great, still great to get an idea of what the hot commodities were at the time, what people were looking to buy on the high street um, and what people were looking to sell. And then last but least, uh, last but not by no means least, I should say, Thacker's Overland News for India and the Colonies, covering 1860 to 1863. So this is another fascinating overseas title. One of the things we're very, we're really looking to do at the moment, well, we're always expanding our newspaper collection, but we're very keen to get more titles from outside the British Isles. We're, we're not, we're not slacking on British and Irish titles. We're still adding loads of those, but uh, we've recently started to add more papers from the likes of India, uh, the Caribbean, um, other places. Uh, <laughs> there's quite a few. But yeah, that's going to be a very interesting title. And we've also added new pages to a load, well, one, two, I'll read them out quickly because there's not that many. The Brief, Berry Free Press, Glasgow Courier, Liverpool Journal of Commerce, I'll be reading that one, New Market Journal, The Pilot, The Press, Sheerness Times Guardian, Weekly Times, and The Witness Examiner. So loads of lovely newspapers for you. And uh, I'm sure most of you have probably seen this already, but one thing I wanted to uh, kind of bring your attention to was that a couple of weeks back, we announced free access newspapers on both Find My Past and the British Newspaper Archive. You can now search and explore. If you don't have a pro subscription to Find My Past or a subscription to the British Newspaper Archive, which means you already have access to all this amazing material, um, if you don't have one of those, you can now search and explore over a million pages from about 158 titles completely free all you need is a registered account uh, to do this when you go into our newspaper search whether it be on far my past or the british newspaper archive keep an eye out on the filters and you'll see uh, an option to select free access titles only you can you can you can search and explore those all their contents page to page without any payment being made at all no paywall for you to bump into and stop you dead in your tracks. Uh, and we're really proud about that. We're really pleased. I think it, it's a great way of kind of opening access to history. Uh, we've tried to include some interesting niche titles in there that kind of, I think it's fair to say, maybe tell the stories of previously underrepresented communities. There's a lot of working class titles in there, like the Poor Man's Guardian, the Beehive, which was kind of a bit of a trade unionist type, kind of title. There's titles from Jamaica, uh barbados there's quite a few very very interesting anti-slavery titles in there uh and obviously it's black history month in the uk in october so i'm going to be reading some of those to get a better idea of the history surrounding the fight to end slavery ahead of that so yeah don't forget to check out free newspapers so that is this week's new records which took me much more time than i thought it would i've been neglecting all your comments um don't forget Question of the week. I want to hear about your antiques and heirlooms. What have you got? Why does it matter to you? What's the story? How have you discovered it? Was it passed down? If it's been done by research, tell me how you did it. Let's have a look and see if we have any answers. Um, I'm just looking for a question of the week. I can't see. Ah! This is from Nicole Hassel. <laughs> oh, Daphne. Um, Daphne Hannon, no. Um, uh, Nicole says, I have a family coat of arms that comes from my three times great grandfather, although we don't know how he got it, but it's been in my family since the 1850s. It's now in the hands of my great uncle in the family home. Oh, lovely. Um, Amy Evans saying, how can you find out where your ancestors worked? For example, I know... You can get their occupation from census records or knowledge from relatives, but you can you find out where exactly they worked. I'm thinking late 19th and early mid 20th century locations of in, interest. Uh, locations of interest are Liverpool, Edinburgh, and Cornwall. That's a really really good question, Amy. Um, I mean, if you can hang on not that long, uh, a pre, the 1921 census of England and Wales will be released next year. Um, and one of the amazing things about the 1921 Census of England and Wales that we're particularly excited about is that it does not just list occupation, it also lists employer. So that will be a massive help. But in the meantime, what can you do? Well, there's a few things you can do, really. Um, 
you can search there are various employment records if they served as an apprentice if they're a member of a guild you might find more information in those but really it's just doing a bit of broader contextual research around the occupation the location you found so say for example uh you have discovered your ancestor a, a liverpool ancestors address in the in the in 1891 census and it tells you they were a i don't know a, a a brass turner or something like that do a little bit of history into the do a little bit of research into the industrial history of liverpool where were the brass factories where were the brass works who what were the companies called that operated them uh were any of them in very close proximity to the address your ancestor lived at you won't be able to tell conclusively whether that's the one they worked at, but if it was, say, only a couple of streets down, that's quite, it's quite likely also. <clears throat> when you're looking at the censuses, have a look at some of the, the, the occupations of the people in neighbouring properties. If there's loads of brass turners living in the same street and there's a big brass works nearby, pretty fair to assume that's where they worked. Uh, but really, yeah, my general advice for that is just do re research say say they were in some kind of manufacturing for example uh do some research around where those centers of manufacturing were, were based in that region uh, have a look in the newspapers if you find any company names you should be able to find more about the company in, in the newspapers um if your ancestor wasn't working in a factory or you know perhaps was a a doctor or something like that there are there are there are there are records for medical practitioners uh, available on Find My Past. You can have a look in directories, trade directories, um, and almanacs are very, very useful in this regard. We've got some fantastic collections up on FMP. Um, they're basically like the yellow pages their day. They'll list all the tradesmen, shopkeepers of a certain area. So you definitely want to be checking those out. Um, and then is there anything I've missed? Probably. Um, Oh, newspapers, adverts. I've talked about newspapers a lot, but yeah, d d look up adverts as well. If your ancestor ran a shop or owned a business, you might find adverts for their business in there. Might give you an idea of the products they sold, what their stock was like. Uh, let's have another look at some more questions. Oh, this is a nice one. Beth, Whit uh, Beth Whitney. I was given a cigarette case by my paternal nan. According to my nan, it was given to her father by a German major prisoner of war in World War I. He was given the item as a thank you, as my great grandfather was giving at least some of the POs some food scraps. Oh wow, yeah, that's a fascinating item with a lovely story behind behind it. Um, I was just laughing at Linda's comment. Uh, I suspect that's because your wife does the cleaning, Alex. Um, not my antiques. No, I wouldn't let her clean my antiques. She might damage them. No, I I, I clean those. Um, probably not as much as I should. Um, which is, I, I, it's it's more the aesthetic, I think. It's more that I think she said that she didn't want to live in some, um, what did she call it? Oh, it was quite funny at the time. Something along the lines of some down, some haunted Downton Abbey drawing room. Um, and that's exactly how I'd like my living room to look. But anyway, um, let's have a look at some more comments. Uh, Sally, I have a silver teapot that was going to be thrown out. I saved it and cleaned it up. I found it was engraved uh, 1911 Reverend W.E. Colgrove and Mrs. Oh, wow. This is my married name, but it was very interesting to find out more about W.E. and his wife. I'm glad I saved it. That's a fantastic story and a great example of one of the first things you should do if you've got an heirloom. Check for any identifying marks. Is there any engravings on there? You might not spot it at first, but like Sally, if you give it a good old polish, they might come out. Um, that's a great one. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Amanda Webb, I have some wooden handmade tools with R Brown inscribed on them. Looking at censuses, you guys are giving all the tips away already. This is great. Looking at censuses, both my three times great grandfather Robert Brown and my four times great grandfather Robert Brown were carpenters. Uh, one of them would have made them. Wow, that's lovely. And yeah, I, I think you do feel that emotional connection to something that your ancestor used with their hands, something so made in this instance, perhaps. Uh, let's have another look. Oh wow, this is a this is a poignant one, Jeff. I have the flag draped uh, that was draped over my grandfather's coffin at his funeral in 1969. Wow, he was wounded in World War One, France. That's a very very precious heirloom. Something you definitely want to keep away from the moths. Um, Janet, a pair of drinking glasses. 
uh, given as a wedding present to my grandparents in 1919 and given to them by an old lady who had been given to de- given who'd been given them at her wedding oh wow if you're able to find out the the uh if you're ever able to find out the identity of the lady who gave them as the gift you could follow the chain couldn't you um let's have another look uh oh Anya, this is this is probably this looks like it's going to be a good one already in my granny's will i was left a ring that apparently belonged to my two times great grandmother my gran wore it all the time i assumed it was her engagement ring but i believe her engagement ring was accidentally lost in a fire the ring did fit me maybe it will once again um but it's lovely to be able to wear yeah wear something having so close to your body something that your your, your gran your granny obviously cherished and wore throughout her life as well um that's, yeah, there's a connection with these items. I think show and tell time. So one of my family heirlooms that I really like are these. I think I probably showed these on a on a live broadcast many many years ago. But these are the um, service binoculars that my great great grandfather Jerry Cox, not my great great grandfather, my great grandfather Jerry Cox, who was a captain in the First World War, uh, used when he was serving in France. Um, and amazingly, so that's the, the case they come in, still in pretty good neck. And I don't know if you can see there, there's like an arrow, maybe. I don't know if that's coming out with the camera because of the light. Yeah, can you see there, that arrow there, noting that it was government property. Um, it's And I don't know if you can see there at the top as well. It says, let me see if we can angle it right with the light. Yeah, you can see that there. Basically, it says... Um, T. French and Sons, London, made in 1916. Did a little bit of research into those, and it turned out that T. French did actually make, Thomas French, I think it was called, did actually make a lot of the service binoculars that were issued to officers during the First World War. Uh, and this is them. Um, so these were made in 1916. They are kaleidoscopic, so they extend. You can see there, it says on the um, metal bits, just about, well, you can't really see that because there's lights. It's a service binocular, high power, and then there's a service a number on them as well, number K one two three five seven eight two. Um, and the next thing on my list I haven't done, which I haven't done yet, is to look up that service number and see what I can find out about them. But they actually, considering these were made over a hundred years ago, they actually work pretty well. The magnification on them is quite good. I'm just looking at a wood pigeon through them right now. Um, and the if the the Picture image quality is pretty sharp, but one of the things I find fascinating about these is I just like wonder what sights he would have seen through them while he was, you know, peeking over the top of the trench. Uh, I imagine some not very pretty things. I think he had quite a well, most of the men who served in France in the first world war had quite a rough time of it, and Granddad Jerry wasn't an exception. But yeah, this these are probably one of my favourite um heirlooms that I uh have been lucky enough to be able to take. Yeah. Uh, from my parents' house because <laughs> they know I love history. Thankfully, my sister isn't that interested, so um, I just take it all. Um, right, let's have another quick look at some more questions. Uh, Ellen Montes- uh, Ellen has said, we have an old bridle that was used on my husband's grandparents' farm. They used horsepower until the late 1930s. Oh, you want to check out some of our farming uh, newspapers then. Um, the farm no longer exists, so it's our only... T- yeah, that's, that's the important thing about heirlooms and items like this. Farm no longer exists, so it's our only tangible bit of it, as well as as um as well as those stalwart plow horses. Oh wow! So you've got the plow horses. That's cool. We're well, not the ones from the thirties, obviously. Those would be very, very, very old plow horses. Um, let's have another look. Jenny Coakley has said, "I sometimes think that my husband's great grandfather, a Russian immigrant on the prairie, in the oh well, wow, in the eighteen sixties, would find it strange that the spittoon from his store is now in an apartment in Denver." Yeah, I'm pretty sure he'd be. Yeah, I think he'd be uh, completely bemused. That's that's an amazing thing to to have as well. And think about the the change that the change that that spittoon will have seen. Obviously, not seen physically because it doesn't have eyes, but the, the, how different the, the life on the prairie would have been in the 1860s compared to modern life now as it's sat in your apartment in Denver. That's a brilliant one. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, let's have a look. Oh, God, there's so many comments, and I haven't got through many of them at all yet. 
Uh, Karen said, question of the week. We recently acquired a small box uh, with bone handled knives from great from grandfather's house, researching there for autopsies. Uh, wow. <laughs> it would be awful if you'd accidentally been using those to eat your, your, your bangers and mash with, wouldn't it? Um, wow, well, yeah. <laughs> good, good job you did your research. You don't want to be using those at a dinner party, do you? That is fascinating. Morbid, but very fascinating. I love stuff like that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Wow. All um, right, there's so many comments. We're going to come back to the comments, but I figured I should do some very general tips on if you if you are looking to discover more about an item you have, how do you do it? Well, I can't go into any great detail. Hopefully some knowledgeable people will have put something in the comments, but I can give you some general starters. I mean, first of all, off, ask relatives. It's always the first thing on the list with tips, whether it's for family history. Are any older family relatives still knocking around that you could ask? Do they remember anything about it? Can they give you any better ideas as to who owned the object? What was it used for? Where was it kept? What Where it was kept? Why is it significant? Um, and, you know, in many cases, you might actually be surprised about what they already know. Uh, the second one is it's pretty basic, but you've got to do it, is very, very carefully study the object. Um, study its shape size color its material substance what is it made of does it look handmade might it have been mass produced can you tell just by looking and feeling it does it seem to be missing any parts could it have actually been part of a larger device um if you've got no idea what it was maybe guess but try to, to make too many assumptions i mean for example you might Fine, you might have a bell. You might, oh, this was probably used to summon everyone to dinner, but in fact, it was actually maybe used to scare away crows on the family farm. Yeah, carefully study the item, what it's made of, its size, colour. Note all this down as well. Uh, look for any identifying marks. Is there a number? Is there a name? Is there a hallmark? Is there a date inscribed on it? All these will be essential. Um, and once you have, if there, if, if there was anything like that, you're able to discern, like whether it's any identifying marks like I found on my binoculars. Um, Google is your friend. There are so many forums out there. So many, so many, so many forums. I was able to find out um, quite a bit about my latest purchase, which I'll purchase at auction, which I'll show you in a little bit, by visiting a load of very, very obscure forums, which looked like they'd been made circa, I don't know, 1996 or something. But there was so much information on there. A very niche area, but if I hadn't looked, I never would have found it. And when I first, sure, I'm just going to show you it. So this is, this, is, this is one of the reasons my wife doesn't like me going to online auctions. This is what I picked up the other day. Another instrument I can't really play. So this is a 1926 Zither banjo. I was able to date it because you probably won't be able to see there, but it says that it's called a Windsor number 46. Um, and I did a little bit of digging. It's be absolutely beautifully made. They don't make instruments like this anymore. I'm pretty sure it's made of mahogany. But if you just see the brass work on the head, they don't make instruments like that anymore. It's amazing. And I can't play it yet. But even though it was made over, you know, nearly 100 years ago, it still has a relatively nice sound to it. There you go. So it still plays. Uh, and I've been driving my wife mental with this. Um, maybe in a couple of months, I'll actually be able to play something half decent. And then I, I yeah. And then I'll show it to you. Probably not. Uh, but even if I can't play it, I'll mount it on the wall and it'll look amazing. So, yeah, I did a little bit. I, I, when I got this, I'm not, I won't tell you how much I paid for it, but I'm pretty sure after doing my research, I'm pretty sure I got an absolute steal here. So I did a little bit of digging. First thing I did was put in Windsor Banjo. Um, and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a Wikipedia page. There wasn't much like that. But then I realized there were all these, these banjo forums. Banjo, apparently banjo enthusiasts don't mess around. People who who banjo banjo hard, uh, and they, there's lots of um, there's lots of banjo forums where people talk about all the history of this. So I was able to find out loads, and by putting in the number, a model number forty six, I was able to date it to around nineteen twenty six, um, and basically this is what I found. I found out that it's not a regular banjo; it's what they call a zither banjo, which apparently these are very you know banjos are obviously instruments of American origin. But apparently zither banjos are quite unusual in the United States. They were very much, they were much more popular in Britain. Um, 
and they were based off so i don't know if you've heard of a zither before but a zither a concert zither was a german stringed instrument that was invented in around the mid to late 1800s um and they had what you call both fretted and drone strings so you've got the the, the strings you play with the frets and then strings that are just left open for the drone and that's what this has so this fifth hit string here apparently is the drone string that's not meant to be changed that's just a tone to the sound of the instrument um and the reason you can tell that normally one of the 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 the, the, the difference between a zither banjo and a other i guess a regular banjo is um the construction and the way you can always identify them is that the, the fifth string american banjos will have a peg here for tuning the fifth string whereas british zither banjos thought we don't need to do that we'll make things much more complicated they drilled a hole into the neck and threaded the fifth string which you can see there through and it came out at the top so that's how i identified it so it's like okay cool this is relatively unusual I, I i i like it um and then i thought i'd do a little bit of um digging into the windsor company itself so you know banjos were introduced into britain in the 1840s when american minstrel shows were coming over and touring they were very very popular in in, in um this is all research i did post banjo purchase by the way uh, very popular in music halls um but the heyday of british banjoing was the late 19th century that was definitely those are the golden days of british british banjo so i've missed i've missed that sadly by a good hundred years and uh, never too late to banjo though um and uh, they became they became incredibly popular and by the 20th century there were up to 100 banjo manufacturers in britain this ranged from very individual craftsmen to factories that were employing scores of workers but the, the one of the biggest the king of british banjos was the windsor company which is the brand that I now own. Uh, the Windsor Company were based in Birmingham and they were founded by a man named Arthur Octavius Windsor. So I had his name. I was able to look him up in the records, did a newspaper search, found an obituary for him. Loads of adverts for the Windsor ba Banjo Company. They made, they made a lot of banjos. Um, but I, I found out a bit about his life. So as a young man, Arthur uh, acquired a thorough knowledge of wood and metal working because what he originally his banjo making wasn't his first trade he originally had a factory made which made coffin furniture and you might go what is coffin furniture it's exactly what you'd imagine it's the metal and kind of wood embellishments that were added onto coffins to make them look pretty so he started out making coffins transitioned into instruments he was a keen banjo player himself and suddenly realized that he much preferred making banjos than he did coffins and i don't really blame him um so he started off with a small workbench in his coffin factory. His workers would build the coffins. He'd make banjos and they proved very popular. They started selling like hotcakes. And he realized, oh, I wanted something here. Expanded, set up a whole dedicated banjo factory. Three years later, he had a huge factory on Newhall Street in Birmingham. Well, not huge. He was employing about 25 by then, um, all making banjos. Um, and eventually they, div they diversified into any instrument with a fret, basically, any stringed instrument with a fret. Um, he was very dedicated in the early days he tested every single instrument before it left his factory uh, and unlike other instrument manufacturers of the day every part of the instrument was made in that one factory and i'm pretty sure that's true up until the 1920s so the model i have every single bit from the brass work to the to the vellum hide that gives it the tone to the string not the strings these aren't 1926 strings obviously but to the wood it was all made in his factory um but sadly, it all came to a rather tragic end. The firm ceased to exist in December 1940 when a bomb from a German air raid hit it and the whole factory went up. Um, and according to some research I've done, it appears that Windsor was probably, may have been the largest maker of fretted instruments ever known in Britain. Um, they made hundreds of thousands of instruments. The New Hall factory in Birmingham alone, he did end up establishing others. Um, probably produced thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands each year. So they're not that unusual. Uh, apparently, they used to be very common, a very common sight in pawn shops across Britain in the in the 1950s, 60s, 40s. Uh, but yeah, and, and that, that's that's my dip into exploring the history of an item. I thoroughly enjoyed it. There's probably more I could learn, but just with a little bit of newspaper searching and visiting the right forums, I was able to find out loads. The name of the guy who made it the company that made it the history of the company that made it the processes they used to make it, it all very very interesting anyway a less about my blooming banjo um 
more let's take a look at all the comments you have been sending in because there's loads and i do apologize if i'm i'm not going to get through them all but thank you so much it seems like this is a popular topic actually ellie i know you're watching i think we might have to get an antiques expert or heirloom expert to join us and give real advice not just my surface level speak to your relatives and check the internet um yeah it looks like this has generated quite a response so watch this space we're gonna get we, we can do a find my past antiques road found, no a found, found my past heirlooms road show digitally um yeah leave that with us we'll find someone but yeah let's have another look at some questions so um jackie nesbitt question of the week when researching the house in braintree where my grandparents and mother and i lived i discovered for, ah from a will how did i forget that from a will that the rocking chair and goss china that i have came from my mother's grandmother who lived in the house before them. Those are great items. And thank you so much for that comment, Jackie, because I nearly forgot to mention wills. How, wills are probably one of the best things you can check. Yeah, if you've got an heirloom, consult your ancestors' probate records. You, you might, you know, it'll be able to, it'll, it'll might help you find out who originally owned it, who passed it from who to who. I love probate records. They, wills are a great way of finding out what mattered in life to your ancestors, but also, the kind of dynamics of relationships, who they liked the most, who was the favourite child, who was getting the prize silverware, and who was getting the old dusty pillows. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe they were nice pillows. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Wills, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Heather has said, question of the week, we were given a sampler, which we were told was done by my husband's great grandmother. I went to a lecture on how to read samplers. Oh, wow. Turns out it was sewn in the late 1700s. That's old with all the initials of three generations. Great help. Yeah, especially if you've got all the initials there. That's of three generations. That's like doing your family tree for you, isn't it? Wow. That's a fantastic one. Um, Andrew Alston, question of the week. I don't have many family items from pre-war. A few are from 1920s and 30s. One is an arts and craft copper frame mirror. Love arts and craft stuff. Uh, dad changed it to a portrait from landscape and it looks very current that sounds lovely <coughs> well heirlooms don't have to date from pre-war um i mean one of the strange things to think about is some maybe some of the things that you've purchased that you absolutely love that you plan to leave to your nearest and dearest they're going to be heirlooms in in a couple of decades um let's have a look at some more um yeah the, the, you guys have i wish i'd actually spent less time talking about my banjo and more time looking at your comments because there are some really really great ones in here and it's going to be such a shame not to get through them all um dawn said i have a medal presented for good conduct and length of length of service given by bernardo holmes oh wow to uh, those children who stayed within their indentured place for x amount of years uh this one i have is named to harold dickinson uh, who was taken from the sheffield union workhouse and sent to canada he fell in World War One. Oh, what a sad, sad life. Um, and I treasure this along with his memorial plaque, Death Penny. Um, he appears to have been orphaned. Uh, not many actually were. That's that's a very poignant and fascinating. Yeah, I don't blame you for cherishing that, Dawn. That's a lovely one. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's a shame we can't see pictures, isn't it? You, I don't think you can share pictures in the comments. It'd be amazing to actually bring these up on screen and get a closer look. Um, Bev has said, uh, my husband's grandfather bought a Jackie Coogan China statue, which stands about 18 inches tall when his father was born in 1923. He also has a bri bride and groom ceramic figures in the figure in figures in the style of Cupid dolls from the marriage in 1921 of his other grandparents. We also have a prayer book and a hymn book that my grandfather gave to my grandmother in 1910 before they married. Uh, the reason I like that comment as well is it shows that a lot of these items were I mean, you've got items that were used, like the tools that have already been discussed before. You've got items that were loved, but then you've also got items like the ones Bev just listed, which were tied to very key life events, wedding presents, christening present presents. Um, yeah, things that marked a, a major turning point in the history of your family. Um, Eleanor, uh, Eleanor said, hey, fever, maybe. It could be hay fever. I, it could be. I also did have my second COVID jab earlier this week, so I may just be feeling the after effects of that. Uh, Marion, with a great with a great suggestion, a hot whiskey. I think I might be going for that as soon as I get off this broadcast. 
Um, let's have another look. We've got five minutes left. Um, Roxana said, oh, and my my daughter was, uh, my daughter has inherited my great grandmother's wedding brooch. Lovely. My great grandmother and my mother were, um, both wore it for their weddings. And now my daughter has it for when she eventually gets married. She's only 12. Still a bit of time to go. But that's lovely. I mean, what a lovely sense of continuation. Um, yeah. They, they, they do say something, they say something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. That could be the something old. That's, um, yeah, and th that would be wonderful if she does eventually get married. It would be lovely to wear something that, you know, her two generations before her have also um, worn. Um, oh, Linda, this is say, you know, obviously, good point. If some items you may actually choose to sell. Um, well, you know, maybe you just don't have space for them in your house. Um, maybe you can really do with the money. Um, but if they, if 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 you have to sell them, take a photo. You can still use that to look back, reflect, enjoy the memories surrounding these items. That's, that's a nice tip. Um, let's have a little look. There's 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 so so many. Um, Andrew Olsen tips and cut glass is difficult to date. When I lived in Starbridge, there were hundreds of glass makers and cutters. Designs are very, very long lived. Um, we are going to get someone on eventually when we find them uh, to, to to tell us how to do this properly. But yeah, my, one of the things I found from doing a little bit of research into the binoculars and the, the banjo uh, is that there are pretty much any kind of item, whether it be glassware, whether it be jewellery, whether it be musical instruments, whether it be binoculars, whether it be tools, there are some, there, there'll be a forum for it. Um, and you can you can post some questions on there. Actually, that's just reminded me of another tip uh, I did want to say before I go was that um, what if an item has um, left your family's possession? You know, you might just you might you might be, you might be looking to discover an heirloom that's that's been lost. This is something Jen reminded me to say before. Um, some yeah, some some items may have made their way outside the family, and it's when when you go to well, I'm, I'm kind of banned from antique shops now, so I've reverted to online auctions. Uh, but when you go into these shops and auctions, it's amazing how many things you see that, you know, are clearly treasured family items, um, things labelled with people's names. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking to recover something that you, you think may have left the family, so eBay is a very, very good place to start. Search eBay, have a look, check online auctions for potential items, and cover, encourage your family members to keep an eye out too. Some auction websites actually let you set up an alert. Uh, so if like a family surname or a detail that could tr you know trigger this connection comes up, you'll get an automatic email sent to you. Not all of them do, but some do. Um, but yeah, that's my tip for trying to track them down. Um, and I think that given that we've only got two minutes to go and I can see a few people already dropping off, I've really enjoyed this one though. I think this is a topic we're gonna have to revisit. Um, is, is yeah i've thoroughly enjoyed it and i hope you have too there's been loads of great ones coming through i'm terribly sorry if i didn't get to your question of the week um i'm sure very everybody enjoyed thoroughly i'm sure people enjoyed reading them can i squeeze in one more let me have a look um oh yeah medals this is a good one sue moon water this is the last one uh, has her maternal grandfather's silver war badge um, and a paternal grandfather's World War II medals. Her father's boys' brigade certificate of medals, both parents' World War II medals, and my mother's, uh, my maternal grandmother's wedding ring, my mother's wedding ring, and my father's signet ring. All people are dead now. But yeah, me um, medals are an important thing, I think, to keep in the family if you can, because, you know, they commemorate sacrifice and, and incredible bravery. But, you know, while it's lovely to have these islands, uh, I heirlooms and items it's always important to remember they are only things um i think it's much of the, the, the kind of emotional the emotional connections to the people who own them are much more important as are the stories that surround them um just something to bear in mind but yeah uh, i hope you've all enjoyed today i certainly have i'm gonna go away and drink hot whiskey and practice some banjo <laughs> um, but yeah no it's been great fun have a wonderful weekend everybody as i said sorry um I didn't get through all the comments. There were loads. This is definitely one for Ellie and I to have a think about and revisit in the future. Um, thank you to everyone who's saying feel better soon. I hope I do because it's bank holiday weekend in the, in, in the UK at the moment. And if I'm sick over bank holiday weekend, that will 
that would be that be rubbish um but yeah lovely way to end the week thank you much thank you much thank you very much everybody uh stay in touch stay safe stay researching stay connected um sorry i'm just laughing at some of the comments that are coming through uh yeah this has been a good one and i will see you all in the not too distant future bye bye oh no that's not the right button to end broadcast this is bye bye for real <laughs>